Good morning, everyone, to, um, and uh, good evening to those of you joining in from other parts of the world. Uh, my name is Madhav Rajan. I'm the Dean and the George Schultz Professor of Accounting at Chicago Booth. I'm, I'm thrilled that you are here uh, taking time to be with us today. Uh, it's great that you could be here to welcome Booth alum Koichiro Nakamura, founder and general partner of Sozo Ventures to the Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, the DSS, of course, is a long-standing Chicago Booth tradition. And the goal is to bring in high profile leaders from the government, uh, from the community, from business to come in and share with you their insights and experience. The DSS of course used to be in person, uh, but then when COVID hit, we shifted to a virtual distinguished speaker series uh, and essentially had a bunch of alums come in and talk about the impact of COVID on their companies. This was back in April of 2020. Uh, we chatted with uh, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, uh, Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft, Jenny Scanlon of UL and many others, uh, learn about just how these executives and their firms were reacting to COVID. The series was so popular that we decided to continue it in that format through COVID uh, and now since beyond that. Uh, and this year in particular, we've had a great series. Uh, we've had amazing talks with uh, Brian Nickel, the CEO of Chipotle, uh, Tony Tang, head of BlackRock uh, China, uh, Eric Gleacher, Russ Hutchinson from Goldman Sachs, uh, Jose Antonio Alvarez from Santander and many others. And uh, today's distinguished speaker, it's really a delight for us that he was able to, to join us. Uh, Koichiro Ko Nakamura is founder and general partner of Sozo Ventures. Um, he made the 2021 Forbes Midas list for uh, the amazing investments that he has made in companies such as Coinbase, uh, Palantir, and for leading Sozo's investment in uh, Square. Now, prior to co-founding Sozo, he spent over 20 years building tech companies and was a member of Yahoo Japan's founding team. Uh, and while at Mitsubishi Corporation, he created uh, Japan's first application service provider and data stations, which was acquired by Value Commerce. Ko also launched the uh, Innovation Kitchen, which incubated uh, seed stage ventures in Japan. And there he invested in university technology and served on the board of uh, Saijinier, Japan's leading discovery engine company, which went public in 2014. So Ko in his role has shepherded hundreds of companies through international expansion uh, and shared his expertise in many, many publications, Nikkei, Market Watch, Forbes Japan, VC Journal, uh, Newspeaks, and many others. So it's really a pleasure. Thank you very much, Ko, for being with us today. Thank you. So uh, maybe to start, could you please share your journey from Mitsubishi Corporation uh, where you were working with large Japanese conglomerates to deciding to come to Chicago booth for your MBA. What was the, 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 the turning point in that decision? Thank you. Um, I, in Mitsubishi Corporation, I built several companies is, uh, as an inside entrepreneur and was able to exit some of them, including value commerce. Uh, I was very rare, trans, tra almost a translator who could co uh, con connect both the world of the few startups in mm -hmm. Japan and the world of the large traditional corporation that Mitsubishi Corporation has a affiliation. Then around 2005, Sogo Shosha Mitsubishi Corporation experienced a boom in the resource investment. So under this stably building the uh, and the stable, stably building a business in, in the startup world was considered a small scale mm. and time consuming business mm -hmm. and not so much attractive for them because uh, the, uh, uh, the company is no, no longer valued those small transactions since natural resource investment can make a uh, uh, a lot of the money by uh, by small number of people and with the billions of dollars trading companies and the trade uh, trading uh, investment and uh, have come to prefer such as an efficient e e uh, business over the small stable company building so i decided to change my career and uh, went to uh, decide to go to the business school so at first um when I came to Chicago, uh, I want to switch my career to money to become the manager of the operating companies. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what was your experience like at, uh, at at Chicago Booth? Was it what you had expected when you decided to come and do your MBA? Um, I we I met with great professors, and uh, I think as an entrepreneur, I have a very limited view of the industry and the companies. And uh, uh, in Chicago, I can see the whole picture of the. Uh, managing the business and evaluating the opportunity. And also I, uh, I learned a lot of the other industry, how it works. <laughs> so those experiences made me to realize, okay, I might not be looking for the management of the company. I might be looking for the investor aspect. So mm -hmm. if I didn't come to the Chicago, I, I never thought about to become the investor. Um, so when, when we chatted earlier this year in California, you had the story about why you chose to come to Chicago versus, uh, um, I think you were thinking about MIT at that point. Maybe you could tell that story on, on what yes. made you change your mind. Actually, we almost decided to go to uh, Boston. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I, my, my wife went to the uh, summer school to prepare the life in Boston. And uh, I, I took the, uh, I was, uh, I, I, we enjoyed the summer, summer life in Boston, but uh, admitted weekend, uh, we came to Chicago and accidentally uh, observed the Steve uh, Professor Steve Kaplan's class, <laughs> and that changed my life. And uh, I came back to the Boston and I told my wife, "My wife, can we go to Chicago?" <laughs> and she was not very happy at that decision, but uh, I I finally did, said, uh, "We will go." And uh, we packed the, uh, all the goods and almost uh, prepared a uh, land contract for at Boston, but uh, we decided to go to Chicago. So we packed everything from Boston and drive to, drove to Chicago with a uh, uh, three years old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> a great story. Um, I want to tell the audience, you should feel free to send in questions through Q&A. I know some of you send questions in advance, which I have, and I'll go through them. But feel free to submit questions through Q&A, and I'll intersperse them with the other questions that I'm going to ask. Ko. Um, so as a VC, one of the main things you do is, is evaluate talent, right? Looking at talent, evaluating talent, deciding are they worth investing in. So one of the questions that has come up a lot is, what are the key leadership competencies that you value when you're looking at somebody? Great question. Um, I believe that most important uh, role of the leader is presenting a long-term vision to the team. Um, it, I, I experienced um, that um, I had a fortune to have uh, those views uh, because I accidentally uh, involved in the industry who is about to happening and almost a time machine. And uh, from in the US, and I joined the Yahoo Japan project. That gives us uh, those wrong vision, and I realized this is more very important for the uh, for the uh, low uh, leadership role. Mm -hmm. So I, I I'm look uh, we are looking at those um, uh, leadership role uh, and the views uh, for the CEOs that attract the team and the building the team and also uh, creating the position of the company. Mm -hmm. And is that easy to do, Coach, when, when you're meeting somebody who's a founder and you're talking to them early on, how do you assess their values? And, and is that somebody you want to make an investment in? Actually, uh, if we, 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 meet the, we meet the CEO without homework, it's very hard to assess. Mm. Uh, people sometimes misunderstood BC meet the people and immediately make a decision. It is not. Before meeting, we will uh, uh, research the company. We will sometimes meet a lot, uh, several people to research the, research the CEO and the management team and uh, how they interact with customers and uh, what's the reputation from the previous job. Those are the, those, those are the homework uh, we do before the meeting. So be, by those homework, you can assess the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, so in your view, what you, so clearly venture funds, some of them have done amazingly well, like, like Sozo, and we'll talk about that. 
others have, have sort of struggled. I mean, can you think about sort of why might some funds do well and some funds not do so well? Um, BC is a very competitive uh, in uh, those days. And uh, you need to offer the solid value to good companies. And startup, a good startup has the power to decide the investors. So therefore, um, good BC will certainly ask about the uh, almost required about the um, characteristic of the value add um, to differentiate uh, with other BCs. So world is almost became like a um, value add company who is various, who can be selected as a uh, good uh, uh, the investor of the good company versus the non-value add commodity money. Mm -hmm. So you uh, BC need to think about uh, how to become the number one value add player in the critical function of the startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you can think about those factors, those value and differentiate uh, yourself from the other, other funds, you, you will be the very good fund. Uh, fund. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you rate the value add from the VC in terms of just being an investor and how active are you once you've made the investment? What do you, what do you sort of do after that? Do you just give the money and go away or what do you do at, like, at the next stage? So though it's a little bit extreme case. So um, before, even before, before investing the company, we often give the value, um, the record square, Coinbase, and the um, Palantir's case, uh, we gave the company like, a, uh, the, uh, we started intact the company two years or three years before the investment. Mm. So we, we attend the uh, customer meeting together or we introduce the leading customer, uh, help to hire the people, establish the, Tokyo office together, or select, uh, refer, uh, selecting the um, um, staff together. Mm -hmm. Those are the things uh, we do before, even before the investment, mm -hmm. even after the exit. Mm -hmm. and, and so you mentioned that Sozo is a bit extreme. In what way is that extreme uh, compared to say a typical VC firm? Um, typical VC firm probably focus on the value add after the investment. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do value add before investment mm -hmm. without any investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. we, I often say to the startups that you will e evaluate us before. Um, you can watch our works and it, it makes sense. You can invest us and uh, we will watch you in the real project mm -hmm. and uh, evaluate you. So mm -hmm. this is a win-win mm -hmm. situation for, for both. Mm -hmm. That, that's that's great. Um, so uh, we have a few questions coming up, and I'll and I'll get to some of them. Uh, maybe before that, you you mentioned Yahoo Japan, which you know in many ways was a very iconic sort of firm, right? I mean, Yahoo Japan was very very successful. Maybe could you speak a little bit about Yahoo Japan and why it became so successful when the rest of Yahoo, you know, relative to the rest of Yahoo, let's say. Um, I think that this is the credit of the uh, management after we established the system and the joined. And the management uh, came from the industry, uh, key industry expert in the uh, operation business in Japan. And the so Masayoshi and the SoftBank team had a great vision. Mm -hmm. so they, they established a unique business uh, uh, fit to Japanese market. Mm -hmm. uh, I will sh share with you the one ex uh, example. So when Yahoo launched, actually the Yahoo was not clear number one yet. Mm. So InfoSeek was there and uh, Lycos is there. Mm -hmm. uh, Ly Lycos was there. And, uh, um, but the, only, uh, the difference started to, to create it. Uh, for example, uh, InfoSeek uh, started to show the stock of, or stock price data partner, by partnering with news, newspaper. Mm -hmm. and, but they are paying. Mm. Yahoo negotiated with Tokyo Stock Exchange. 
I will give you the space and you can uh, give us a data to the stock price, but you have to pay. <laughs> I thought the negotiation was crazy, <laughs> but the, the SoftBank management convinced Tokyo Stock Ex Exchange. We have a same exposure of the major newspaper. Thus, you have to pay for us. Mm. Somehow they convinced. Mm. And uh, that creates a huge difference between the competition of the other InfoSeq because uh, InfoSeq need to, need to pay for the content. Mm -hmm. But the Yahoo gained the money by giving the space for the content provider. Mm -hmm. And that creates a brand. In the beginning, they create a different brand. Even Tokyo Stock Exchange is paying to show the data on the Yahoo. Mm -hmm. Those are the sm small thing in the beginning, but it creates huge difference over the mm -hmm. brand. Mm -hmm. And what drove you to make the decision to start Sozo in the US versus Japan? That's a gr uh, great question. In Innovation Kitchen, the opposite mirror of the Sozo, almost yeah. like a Sozo version zero. Mm -hmm. um, taking the university technology mm -hmm. and start the company from Japan to global. But it was extremely difficult because, because of the risk tolerance, um, um, the Japanese people and the corporation will never be the first penguin mm. to jump off the cliff. Mm. Mm. They need a case, they need an example before making a decision. So in the innovation kit, kitchen, the successful company case I need to introduce to the US market and get the first customer and reintroduce to Japan. Mm. Like a, you know, the import, export and the assemble and the import. Right. It takes time and I realize this model doesn't work. Mm. So instead, Sozo Venture is a company who established the leading position mainly for the US market, uh, technology from all of, over the world. Then they, we will help the company to expand to Asia and Japan. Mm -hmm. That that uh, risk tolerance wise, it makes sense because Japanese is more risk averse, mm -hmm. and they utilize the uh, uh, the the, uh, um, the proper uh, risk tolerance. Uh, we can make a great model. And after we help the first company, Twitter, mm -hmm. we realize. This is, you know, 100 times easier mm -hmm. than the opposite model. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, questions about sort of what trends are you seeing in venture now? And are they differential in Japan versus the Bay Area? Um, I think that, you know, competition is a very getting more severe and the uh, um, um, almost monopoly in the startups in the leading category and also the uh, the investor who can be who, who can be selected with those companies and because of that um, you know a few years ago there is a series B and the new the uh, existing investor invite like five companies to be new to, to be the new investor mm -hmm. but not anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, those great company is a monopoly almost captured by existing investor. Mm -hmm. and only one will be invited. So mm -hmm. you need to be selected one investor who is uh, who has a value and who is worth to invite. So this trend is very going on and going on. And uh, uh, the other aspect is, um, I think the 2015 to the 2020, the major investment uh, segment is uh, was the uh, um, fintech, and uh, I think new upcoming the harvesting timing segment is the logistics and the manufacture AI, mm -hmm. and the probably next upcoming trend is the healthcare IT section, mm -hmm. and the probably ESG environmental affair related section will be the next one. Mm -hmm. So those trend is the upcoming. And uh, I think the new trend after the 2000 is 
even new those, you know, for example, fintech and the logistics, there's a no pure inside of the logistics category company. Um, I think there's a in many intersection of the company, uh, the industry mm -hmm. it will be the new sector of the uh, emerging on the, you know, hot, hot investment area. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the basic trend. Um, I think Japan um, has a, like a two to three years behind trend after, after the uh, US market. Mm -hmm. And some, some sector because of the, you know, different regulation takes like a more, more, more time. But basically we see a similar trend. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of questions. One uh, says, do you, can you just share more on why you made some of your specific investments? So uh, Palantir, for example, uh, what sort of made you invest? And uh, yeah, why don't you answer that call? And then I have a follow on for you. Thank you. Um, for Palantir was a very interesting company. Uh, after we invested Twitter, uh, and, uh, uh, the Twitter management introduced Palantir. Mm -hmm. So Palantir, we met and uh, uh, at, at that time, uh, Palantir is a leading data company and every Silicon Valley people wanted to invest. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are talking about get, uh, going to Japan and they are talking about asking us about the, uh, how to select the best, best partner or system integration partner. And we told them, let's go, uh, we can directly invest in, introduce the uh, customers. Mm. You should talk to the customer directly at least to, Change, uh, you know, adapt uh, necessary business, uh, you know, appropriate business structure. Mm. And uh, after we directly introduced the customer, uh, the Japanese uh, customer, including governmental sector, financial sector, and the retail sector, we quickly realized this is a super unique company, uh, mm. no comparable because every company never asks the price. Mm. <laughs> because other alternative uh, solutions such as IBM solution or uh, Fujitsu Hitachi solution takes like a consolidated data takes two to three years. Mm. Then beginning to analyze the data. Mm. Palantir told those customers, we can assemble the data in two weeks and a week we can start analyzing. Wow. So every management did not ask about the price because so different. And uh, um, we realized this is a you know, revolutionary changing company. And uh, I think that that was to help the company. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, help, help, we started to help the company and the management said, we will give you the allocation. Mm -hmm. This That's is a mon monumental company, little so uh, uh, even nobody knows, uh, can, could win the deal of like a Palantir. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a great story. Uh, and also, maybe you could share uh, Coinbase as another example. I mean, there are a lot of companies that were trying to get into crypto. Why did you choose them as the company to invest in? That's a great question. Um, we met Coinbase around 2014. Uh, it was uh, uh, the, the reason I mentioned the, the year, it was the worst year for the crypto company to, to talk to the customer because mm -hmm. the large, largest crypto related uh, uh, illegal uh, data access happened uh, called Mount Gox in Japan. Mm -hmm. That because after this incident, everybody totally see the crypto company are almost like a criminal company. Mm. Nobody talked. And the, uh, Coinbase wanted to talk to the uh, major Japanese banking group and also the government. Nobody took the, their meeting, but uh, we uh, we talked to the, we 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 talked to the, their uh, major investor, and uh, and we realized this company is different from others. This company is clearly try to be the infrastructure of the uh, crypt transactions. They hired like a, a hundreds of uh, lawyers and the legal staff inside of the company and try to get the uh, official 
um, you know, uh, put um, license of the every state and every company and then making the uh, partnership with, with every major financial institutions, which is not very easy and which is very diff unique approach. And especially we talked to the couple of the uh, US financial player and the European financial player who is you who already become the uh, partner of the Coinbase, such as the New York Stock Exchange or Barclays. And we realized uh, potential customer and the partner also understood the value of the company. Mm. So we, we patiently introduced the company to the Japanese um, um, but, uh, financial group and uh, Mitsubishi UFJ financial group uh, because of their experience to invest, uh, participate to the Morgan Stanley, they realized the compliance requirements and also the security requirement of the US market is very difficult. Getting this every 50 states uh, license is not mm. easy. Mm -hmm. So they started to realize the value of the Coinbase and that they finally decided to partner with them. Mm. After the Mitsubishi UFJ financial group, the partners uh, announcement, they, can, they could create a partnership with other countries such as Singapore and Thailand. Mm. That give us a very good investment uh, a value add and making the investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. Um, so Sort of a follow on is, uh, what do you do once the company goes public, like Coinbase or Palantir? Do you tend to exit? Do you hold on? How, how do you make that decision? We strongly believe the, uh, like we, we make a model and we strongly believe the company, um, we uh, a fair value of the company. So most of the company, uh, going up the value after the IPO because we we, we see we see the quality of the company. Mm -hmm. So if the company little bit uh, took took the time to uh, to reach to that price, we will patiently hold. Mm -hmm. But uh, we 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 tend not to take the uh, market risk after the IPO. However, some company is not valued. Uh, the market immediately. For example, SARS company, if they are growing very rapidly, uh, they, uh, their financial statement is not great at that timing because of the, they, are incur they, they are requiring a lot of the cost at the same time. Mm -hmm. But the, once in the stabilized uh, growth, they, they see the real, uh, you know, a fair value of the company. This is almost like a uh, revenue recognition timing difference of the gap, US gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we balance those and we analyze this, uh, the, the fair value of the company of what we believe mm -hmm. and decide the selling timing. Okay, that sounds great. So one of the questions just about how you run things, when you uh, want to launch a venture fund, how do you find the investors and who comes first? I mean, the companies and the fund or the investors or you already have a set of people you know who are going to be uh, investing. How do you? How does that play out? Um, when I start the, uh, I, I started. I decided to start it the Sozo. Uh, Phil Wickham, co-founder of the Sozo, uh, at that time CEO of the Kaufman Fellows Program. My teacher, another teacher mm -hmm. next to the Steve, um, to told me do the deal before the forming the fund. Mm. This is a typical mistake uh, if you uh, before creating the fund you have to have a ideal deal and you have to show the model by creating the ideal deal you can find the investors hmm. so we, we we did the investment we we did we did business development for the twitter and you know acquire the investment opportunity and then we formed the concept fund Mm. That timing, everybody sees the value of us, and that the people you can convince the value can be the could be the investor. Mm -hmm. So after Twitter, we can quickly raise the money from the Twitter related project or see the people who see the value of the Twitter project. Mm -hmm. Then we can form the fund one. Mm -hmm. So 
the, the, the order should be the opposite. So mm -hmm. you create a value and uh, you show the demonstrate the value, then you can talk to the people who understand the value. Mm -hmm. That sounds fantastic. So we have a couple of questions related to sort of trends that you're seeing. Uh, one question is people are curious on your thoughts on uh, NFTs and the metaverse. And do you feel like in 10 to 15 years, we will all be in the metaverse or where do you think, how do you think that's going to play out? I think that, uh, that the you know, high trend and watching the industry, but uh, we, I, I strongly believe, uh, you know, by the way, when I was in Chicago in the summer intern, I worked for some, uh, you know, venture capital. Um, we, I introduced a company called uh, Linden Lab, the, who was the very first runner of the, you know, metaverse world. Okay. Linden Lab is a um, second life. They, 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 they all. And uh, that timing um, concept is great. The many companies started to the operation or you know advertisement over the second life. However, because of the contents, uh, the, uh, the, the production of the contents is not sufficient, and also the infrastructure is not sufficient. So people started to lose the momentum because you know because of the production is not sufficient, everybody started to see the similar avatar. <laughs> <laughs> and the joke was, um, because of the avatar is very similar, people mistook the people. So those things, you know, discourage the people and, um, you know, lost the momentum. Mm -hmm. However, this time, probably infrastructure is more, much more better and there's mm -hmm. potential to be the larger industry. However, you know, for example, Great technology and the became the infrastructure. They don't often promote the technology itself. So if meta meta technology or metaverse technology or NFT became the behind the inside of the uh, the core business model, it will be the big business. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, we as we we started to see the body of the NFT or metaverse. Uh, not directly relevant to the, the promoting the technology itself, but also the uh, compo key components of the technology and the fit, which are the different aspects. For example, behind the tracking system of the logistics or mm -hmm. um, new technology to interfacing of the logistics or manufacturer business. Mm -hmm. the, those are the kind of the uh, sector we see we see the traction, mm -hmm. but uh, you know. We don't. It, probably the the tech, uh, the industry will be will be the very different industry people now see mm -hmm. to be the future mm -hmm. successful industry. Yeah, great point. Uh, another question was: Do you think investing in five G and edge startups is important to developing cutting edge applications for you know the growth of Web three and metaverse and things like that? Yes, uh, I think the infra, uh, base base in telecom in infrastructure technology is a very driving the new opportunity for the up 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 area of the contents. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very ironically, um, it, it's very ironic that uh, U.S. market uh, because of the com competitive land, uh, uh, landscape and also the protection of the. It, uh, people's access for the infrastructure has a less incentive to introduce a new technology to differentiate between the telecom player. That was I, I learned in uh, Chicago from the mm -hmm. Professor Goldsby. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, I think the US the telecom player has a less incentive or less, co uh, less competitive advantage of the introducing the baseline technology, new, new baseline technology. But the probably outside of, of the United States, uh, the, the telecom provider or content provider is a more incentivized to introduce the, those kind of new technology to differentiate upper, say, up, upper layer services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the US, US company, because of the law, you can take advantage of others' investment regardless of you invest or not. Mm -hmm. so because of that, probably 5G and the edge technology will be introduced probably potentially outside of the US first. Okay. 
Great point. Uh, one other industry has come up called ed educational technology, ed tech. Where do you do you see that as a growth area for VC funding over time? Yes. Um, I think the uh, people change the work style and the lifestyle by COVID. So probably two to three years, they, they, they move forward uh, the new style of the uh, life, including the education. Mm -hmm. So education, uh, like, like this opportunity, um, you, you can have a more educational opportunity over the uh, internet or mm -hmm. Um, time-saving manner or more variety of the style mm -hmm. but that gives a more customized and personalized education mm -hmm. and uh, I think that could be the benefit of the new new technology mm -hmm. so this is opportunity for those mm -hmm. uh, yes okay uh, some questions on like what does it take to become successful in the venture industry first question is just you know for somebody coming in into the industry from outside what are some skills that you think are essential for somebody trying to make that transition? Um, I learned in Chicago and uh, uh, Phil, uh, Professor Kaplan uh, told, uh, taught, taught me and also the uh, Phil taught me in Kaufman is venture capital is a kind of the um, mount climbing tea. So you, 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 you need to combo, com composed of the different skill set people mm -hmm. who can find the deal, who can, you know, differentiate, who can add value to the company portfolio, potential portfolio companies, and who can assess the company, right? Who can monitor the company. Those are the people, uh, those, those are the, uh, those function is an, a very essential function as a team. So mm -hmm. the, the advice for the, for the people who wanted to, uh, be the venture capitalist um, uh, to to join the team who you can add the body for those function. But you can have a variety of the um, experience for the VC. For example, you can be the operator of the startup company. You can be the journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, you you could be the journalist before the company. Mm -hmm. Many many uh, many B great VC was a former journalist, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Professor mm -hmm. and also the uh, uh, um, accounting or you know finance specialist. Mm -hmm. But the uh, important thing is you can pair with the people who can compose the whole set of the BC mm -hmm. experience and expertise, mm -hmm. and that strategically build the uh, uh, experience and the relationship based on your uh, career experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, great point. Uh, question about the VC industry in general, has the relationship of LPs and GPs, how has it changed over the past few years? Um, I think the similar topic, um, I think that after 2000, uh, um, more, uh, the concentrate of the successful VC is a very more and more obvious. Mm. So, uh, similar to the uh, entrepreneur, if you are successful BC, uh, you can choose the LP. Mm. Mm. And, uh, and those dynamics is very sifting that, that aspect. So if you are in the winning side, you can select the BC, uh, LP who is aligned with your um, strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but and the other trend that we, we started to see is that because of the inclusion of the many industry players to the PC world, like us, you can educate the industry and the include uh, to the B, bench, uh, LP industry, LP candidate, even the company, the entity is not very accustomed with the PC industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's expansion of the LP and uh, from the non, 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 you know, we said sophisticated people to the non-sophisticated people, but who has a who has a different value. Yeah. So I, I think that you know, uh, if you are new in the industry, you should think about expanding the little bit. Um, uh, think about outside the box to talk to the new types of the LPs. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You might need to educate them, or you might need to um, think about the unconventional way to work with those LPs. But uh, if you can, you are successful, you can build a unique LP relationship, uh, which is a very different lands uh, the, the the landscape. Mm -hmm. and, and so, given Sozo's success, do you now have a set of LPs you can call on whenever you want to if you're raising sort of more money? Actually, um, we are intentionally selecting the LPs mm. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. some, some industry or some LP, we said no. People surprised if you say said no. Mm. And uh, uh, even now, uh, even larger check side, we sometimes say no to the LP, which is not fit to our strategy. Mm. Uh, could you maybe give an example of that sort of not not names, but just what might be an example of somebody whose characteristics you didn't want as an LP? For example, um, Japan has a, a, a the, uh, the the corporate group called Keritz. Hmm. Some LP who said, "I want to exclusive in the industry. Mm, mm, mm. I, I will give you more three times money, but please exclude those two competitors." Right. We said no, mm. and we and also some investor wanted to invest like a larger amount of the investment. Like a, we we received we just received the money from the Japanese governmental related entity called JIC, mm -hmm. and the, the, they 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 wanted to invest more, but we said you can maximum ten percent of mm. our allocation, mm. five percent of our allocation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we cut back, but those entity often very surprised and shocked mm. to offer lower uh, amount of the their uh, offer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so Ko, we have some questions about sort of Japan. Uh, and question one was: uh, Japan has historically uh, restricted foreign ownership of majority interest in Japanese companies. Do you, has that been evolving to reflect what's happening elsewhere in the world, or uh, where do you see that going over time? I think the foreign ownership is not all industry strategic uh, restriction. Um, BC industry is not very, uh, uh, you know, even the fund fund related investment is very captures the majority of the portion of the company so not not many cases it, it's not the issue for bc industry mm -hmm. and uh, i think those kind of the ownership registry more than the ownership registration like a, uh, a license or registration requirements is a is a prevent the bc or private equity investor to get into japanese market mm -hmm. those trend is this in the discussion of deregulation probably but mm -hmm. not 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 changing the uh uh deregulation yet i think the offering uh ownership restriction is also similar um they're in the discussion of the um deregulating those or you know lower the restriction i think that in five to ten years this will be more open but um, still in the discussion mm -hmm. Uh, the other question, which is sort of related, was about uh, Japan has had historically many big global companies, you know, Sony, Honda, Toyota, you know, it's a, it's a huge list. Uh, but but startups, particularly in the last, say, three to four decades, have tended to stay small. And the question is sort of what do you think Japan can do to, to change that, to get these startups that are much more successful? I think that uh, what happened in the Europe in the two, after the 2005, I think uh, uh, and, uh, um, follow, follow, after following that, South America and Singapore, what happened to those industry is probably the Japanese venture industry is going to happen. So small domestic investor for the small exit, not cross cross uh, border investment between the uh, to the company or mm -hmm. this industry is not what's not happened but after 2005 uh, five, beginning of the uh, 
like a big, beginning of those cross border uh, global standard investment uh, we, we, we I, I, I would say happened in the Europe was uh, uh, creating of the crandom and uh, investing in Spotify that changed the people's concept and the globalization happened. Mm -hmm. And probably, hopefully in five years, Japan will have a similar situation. Some you know, global standard investment happened and the cross-border investment happened that will drive to the new standard of the larger ticket size and the larger exit size companies started to boom. Mm -hmm. But to do that, um, you have to do the right way. You have to create a few success model and modify and assess and tune, then you can scale. Mm -hmm. But instead, um, I think the Japanese government is what, what they are trying to do is um, replicating the not successful model in the small scale. Mm -hmm. Often mistake of the government. Um, you you have to do the right things correctly and then you, you can scale and also um, governmental people tend to think about venture is a number game. Mm. So you generate more company success rate, success uh, company is going to happen. No, if you you duplicate the failing model, you, you just simply fa uh, increase the failure company. Mm -hmm. Those are the very important uh, point uh, uh, Jap uh, government need to rethink. But uh, those are the, I, I, I'm very positive about the Japanese BC industry and the venture related ecosystem. But one concern I have is governmental long direction of the supporting the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions just about how you evaluate investments. And uh, one, one interesting question is, can you think about uh, a, 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 an investment that you thought was going to be successful, but turned out not to be true? And, and if that happens, how do you go back and try to evaluate it? What do you try to get, get from that experience? Um, for example, um, we... I, uh, our our failure is not uh, we 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 strong, uh, I strongly believe BC not uh, not successful case is op, uh, not that case. Some company successful. We we only need to do is uh, uh, giving the uh, uh, you know some some companies not go, going to be uh, growing as we expect. That happens. That's okay. But the the failure of us is. You could, we couldn't see the potential of the company you missed. Mm. So Spotify, DeepMind, um, Current, Bolt, I can name a lot of the company we had a chance to work with and uh, we could invest the company, but we, could, we couldn't see the opportunity and also we couldn't convince the Japanese industry to to adapt the technology, mm. create a sufficient value, we can find many, many companies. Mm. So those are the failure for us. And uh, we really wanted to be uh, more deep study and understanding the industry and the case and try to convince the company and also their customer uh, potentially from Asia to see the value of the company. So those are, if we cannot do it, we cannot bring the company to the Asian market, we miss mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the things we want, we, uh, we want to improve. And we are doing a lot of the infra, uh, infrastructure investment and the, a lot of the educational investment for the pot potential partner in Japan to capture the, those, uh, those, those opportunity. And we do internally also the, a lot of the effort to hire the best people to see those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the incredible answer. Uh, another question was when you are evaluating a company, do you look at, uh, in your experience, how important is the diversity of the management team and the staff at startups and sort of how do they uh, affect the company's performance over time? Um, BC, uh, uh, Professor Kaplan and, and uh, other professors research, the uh, re uh, uh, previous research uh, indicate that uh, 
most key point is uh, uh, um, management team's um, background to evaluate the company. Mm -hmm. So if you if we want to see the global category leader, make mm -hmm. sure team has a, a background of uh, capture those market. Mm -hmm. so for that aspect, diversity is almost must potential for the team to capture the variety of the market and the cross-border market and also the diverse market. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we see the, the very strengths of the diversity to mm -hmm. capture the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned ESG in the beginning. Do you see that as something, do you focus on that as part of your investment? And more broadly, do you see that trend as something that's going to continue over the next several years? Yes, uh, I think that after the, uh, uh, as I, I, I experienced, uh, next to the healthcare IT sector, ESG will be the next uh, potential market. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that um, we started to see the uh, platform technology company who is monitoring and tracking the, uh, the ESD related data mm -hmm. uh, is starting to boom. So yes, we see the great opportunity and we see the uh, potential and also ESD has a many cross section in, uh, 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 business opportunities. Mm -hmm. So cross section of the fintech, the, like a credit trading, and also the cross section of the logistics. Mm -hmm. uh, they can improve the efficiency of the log logistics or manufacture mm -hmm. or software data platform. So mm -hmm. those are the probably cross section of the ESG plus uh, other section is a very potential market for the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a question for you, how much do you get involved in, for example, if you have made an investment and you feel like things are not going well, in terms of stepping in and saying, you know, there need to be changes made in the management team or bringing in new people, do you go that far ever? Yes, um, I think that, you know, if the thing is going to, to great, BC have to step out to not do this stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The thing is not going to well. We need to uh, uh, um, help the company. Sometimes uh, paying for management changes. Uh, that that timing, uh, yes, uh, very limited to lim limited things we can do. But uh, we will do our best to um, turn out the company. Mm -hmm. And some some firm is very good at those help and uh, we try to intentionally uh, select, uh, uh, evaluate the existing um, investors and uh, see the potential of the company. If the industry or company is very, have some risk of the future direction, we will try to uh, make sure to check the, those kind of the the, exi the existing investor who can help those situation mm -hmm. and his tra track record of the investor. Mm -hmm. So, so it's generally uh, have ability to help the global market related mm -hmm. issue. So we sometimes, uh, you know, help to, uh, to switch the management or people who is related, responsible, responsible for the global market. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, we have a question that came in about uh, China versus uh, Japan, particularly if you look at semiconductors, which is China, you know, for China is a big priority. Do you see China catching up in semiconductors and auto manufacturing, for example? Um, I think that, you know, Japan cannot compete with the uh, cost of the production. And also China, China had a great technology and also a great market. Hmm. So, but uh, I think that uh, Japan had a um, different uh, advantage of the different market. And I think that, you know, overall semiconductor, if the, uh, the production is, a, is a, the competition of the scale, it's very hard to compete. Mm. But uh, some tech component technology or some section of the technology who, which required more sophisticated market or advanced, advanced usage, uh, Japan has an advantage, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other aspect is probably uh, I see the many 
uh, technology partnership started to come back to Japan after the um, political conflicts sure. and also the uh, system differences. Probably Japan is a very strong um, alliance with the Western world uh, or countries. So mm -hmm. probably that aspect we can differentiate with uh, uh, um, the, the uh, and also the Japanese had a relatively stable political situation. So we can uh, see the potential of the Japanese uh, uh, partner for the Western uh, countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to uh, also point out uh, that you uh, and your firm take research very seriously. You put a lot of time and effort into studying firms, you know, before, after, and studying the industry in general. Um, and I know your new uh, book just came out, so perhaps you could uh, say a little bit about that. Yes, uh, Sozo is a unique entity uh, partnering under, uh, the, with the top firms and also, also the researching a lot of the uh, other industry players such as corporation, uh, the interaction with the ventures. By those data, we can target with the prospective company and uh, as early as possible, that creates a value as opportunity for us to get to know the company better and get, 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 uh, have an opportunity to collaborate before the investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of those aspects, uh, we have a, a unique ability to know the, who is a good best investor in the industry. And also my co-founder, Phil, has a great relationship with many of the top funds um, because of the Kaufman Fellows experience. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we uh, at, at the same time, we try to educate the uh, uh, industry and the uh, uh, BC industry, venture industry and the startup community in Japan and the world. We decide to um, some of the general knowledge or information to more broader public outside of our investors. Mm -hmm. So we decide to have a, a column in the various media and uh, some of the uh, news media uh, requested us, uh, how about writing a book of uh, top investor from the all over the world mm -hmm. to introduce their strategy and their view and what is the um, uniqueness. So we published a book called Venture Capitalist in Japanese first. And uh, I think we are going to work on the English version in half a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we just launched the uh, Japanese book. Co uh, Phil is a co-author of the book and the journalist, one of the journalists, uh, who wrote about Apple um, in from Japan and co-author with him. And uh, we just uh, released the book last week. Yeah. And uh, this book became the top uh, top business, top selling business book uh, in Japan. And uh, um, now people is talking about the book. Well, I wanted to say congratulations to you. And I think your story is a very Chicago story in terms of what you came to the school for, what you've taken away. And you've just done an amazing job uh, applying that and obviously applying your own skill and talent to being phenomenally successful in a fast growing industry. So we're very, very uh, proud of all that you have achieved and grateful that you take the time to come to us today. So I'm gonna leave you with one last question, which is a personal question, which is who has been your greatest mentor over the years? Um, since I joined uh, university, uh, Professor Steve Kaplan continuously supporting us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kaplan, Professor Kaplan introduced uh, Phil, and uh, Phil is, uh, became uh, my mentor too. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's very obvious now for the value of the Sozo, but uh, before Sozo formed, uh, Professor Kaplan continuously supporting and you know, giving uh, guidance. So great benefit of the Chicago is a great world-class professor. And uh, he, he's a uh, great, great person. And uh, uh, as, as an expert, of course, and uh, also the, as a person. Okay. Thank you. That was a wonderful answer. And thank you again for taking the time and, and for being so 
uh, candid and passing along so much information to our students and alumni. As I said, we're incredibly proud of what you have done and we wish you uh, continued success and we really appreciate your engagement with, with the school. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.